Hello, sorry for the delay. I am uh, I am happy that you are on you are present here, and so um, that's my pleasure to to invite uh, Artemio Aracia to to give a talk in uh, in CRC where it was quite difficult to arrive. Okay, so Artemio, I think uh, you can put the sound. No. You don't have the sound. I know. Uh, when, uh, yes, I mute. So I will mute. Uh, I have sounds. Okay, so, so if you are, uh, I have to stop the sound. Okay. So please uh, go ahead. Let me, so we don't get there. Um, where are we? Here, okay. Okay. So uh, thank you for the invitation, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here in your EcoTEP project. So, I work at the Polytechnical University of Catalonia, and I'm just going to talk about a, a new, more or less new uh, enhancement of the uh, neural network, which is the neural ordinary differential equation. This is a model that has been proposed early in 2018. And so I'm going to, and maybe most of you knows about neural networks, right? But I, I'm going to go through the basics of neural networks in order to understand, you know, how do we go from the neural networks to the neural ordinary differential equation, right? Which is like a sort of like a, a continuum, you know, of this discrete model. All right, so this is the typical picture of a, a one layer, one hidden layer neural network. This is the hidden layer, this is the input, right? So, uh, and it's usually, I mean, there are very many variations, but uh, the common uh, model that and the one we're going to be talking about is a fully connected, you know, so all inputs connect to the uh, hidden nodes in the hidden layer and uh, each hidden node is uh, obtained by a, a regression, a linear regression on, on the inputs, right? And according if they're, here the linear regression, if you, if the values goes over a certain threshold, then you transmit a signal, right? And the signal is given by a, a nonlinear fu function, usually, which is called the activation function. You collect all those signals in, again, a uh, re uh, linear regression, and that will be your output. So that's the basic idea. Let's look at the um, uh, algebraic, algebraic uh, expression, right? So the single hidden layer, we have like, uh, the inputs, right? And then here's the, we, we collect, you know, uh, for each uh, hidden node, we collect uh, linear regression, right? And here is my activation function that uh, according to the value that it gets, then you also collect all those signals in a linear regression. And the output can also go through a, a nonlinear function or could be just the identity, right? So my function psi could be also phi or, or, or any other, okay? So that's the basic nonlinear function, nonlinear, I'm sorry, a neural network, uh, one hidden layer neural network. And this is how you will compute the output. I mean, the, the whole point of this is like you guess values. I mean, the parameters here are the weights and the bias. Right, so you have to guess some weight, some bias, right? Uh, compute this <coughs> and see how far you are, you know, this estimation from some known value that should be related to my input X, okay? And then you, you improve, you optimize on this, okay? So we will see how we do optimize. So here is a list of like typical activation functions. Uh, uh, typical use are the heavy size, 
but that's not differentiable. And we will need to have a differentiable because in order to optimize, we want to uh, compute a gradient. So we want to compute a, a partial, uh, a, a partial derivative, right? The rectify linear, which is very simple, but surprisingly useful, the hyperbolic tangent and the logistic sigmoid, which is actually uh, as, uh, an uh, approximation of the heavy side. So let's concentrate on heavy side and sigmoid for, for, um, for, what, for what's coming. So that there are others, but these are the most used in the literature. You can in, increase the number of hidden layers. And so this will be a multi-layer neural network, which nowadays has become to be known as deep neural network because I think it's the most catchy name, right? But it's just uh, to repeat this uh, same pattern of having a hidden layer and the same uh, transformation goes over from the input to my output. Now you take uh, linear regressions at your first hidden layer, uh, you collect them here uh, as uh, the linear regression, then apply a, a nonlinear function, which will be your activation function. You collect all the you know, activations, you know, uh, for the next layer, you know, an, another, sorry, another uh, real linear regression and so on until the end. So I will put you here the, the, the in vectorial notation, I think it's the thing. Now here's the matrix of weights. So my first step, I have an input, right? Uh, this is a vector of say D uh, entries. I apply my first, matrix of weights plus my bias, my vector of biases, and that will be the vectors of uh, hidden nodes in the, in the first hidden layer, right? And like, so the second step will be, again, to apply my uh, another matrix of weights to the vector of hidden no, uh, nodes that are, are go through a a nonlinear function, right? And so you construct this linear regression on, on these nonlinear values and apply possibly or not a, another nonlinear function, all right? To get the, to get the, uh, the output. And this is the, so the vectorial notation for the uh, one layer neural network, right? And for D layers neural network, you just repeat this. So to be formal, you know, at the zero stage, you have just the input, that's the zero. And then and the new layer will be just the composition of a linear composition of the previous layer for which you apply a, a nonlinear function and have a linear composition you know, for all the nodes at that layer and so on. So this, was, this is actually your, your uh, your output, no? the estimation that you're doing, right? In this stepwise composition of linear regressions that then you collect through nonlinear functions, right? And then keep on collecting in linear regressions and so on. So this is what is known as the forward evaluation. So this is the, like the first part of a neural network. The first, no, a neural network or a deep neural network consists of doing, of selecting no, your weights and bias, right? And then you evaluate and you see how far you are from the expected uh, value associated to X, right? And then you have to tune, right? So that's what is called the, the training part, no? You do this several times, no? The weights and the bias are different for different things? Yeah, you may just choose them at random, all right? But then when you uh, 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 evaluate. Now, this is the part that now you try to tune. Now, this time they won't be uh, as, as random, but because you are going to, once you do this evaluation, right, then you can select any cost function or a loss function, right? And let's like say if it's quadratic cost, or if you are computing the mean square error of your estimation and the true value, all right? And according if this is you know, reasonable, then you may keep those weights and bias that you have selected and then use it 
for uh, uh, forecasting, for prediction. So they, they are random, the weights and the bias? They I'm sorry? They are random? Uh, yeah, at the beginning you can, yeah, actually, yes, you select them at random, maybe uh, independently. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe if you want to follow some Gaussian distribution in order to select your uh, uh, your parameters. So the parameters are the weights and the bias in this case, okay? But now you, uh, what you want is like, mm, you want to, so, so my theta here is this collection of weights and bias that you have selected randomly, right? And then uh, when you uh, evaluate, you know, how far it is from the expected uh, value that you should have for the X, no, which is part of your training data, right? Uh, you now want to minimize this cost function, all right? And here is where, again, you select according to those values. I mean, now you can do some sort of stepwise and your, your weights that you already selected, just add some perturbation, some epsilon value to them or subtract some epsilon value to them in order to, uh, you know, in this stepwise manner, uh, uh, have the, the, the gradient of this function uh, be as, as negative as, as, it's, as, as it could be, right? All right? So that's why it's called the gradient descent, right? You are, in, in fact, the updating of your theta should have this form, right, where you, the values that you compute for your gradient of your cost, which is the partial derivative. I mean, if I uh, develop my cost function using Taylor series, right, I get this expression, right, and this is what I have to like uh, minimize, and the minimum is obtained when this uh, gradient points, you know, uh, in the negative direction, right. So I. Uh, Actually, this is the updating you do, you know, and then evaluate again for this, for 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 this new update of the parameters, until you know your cost is below some epsilon. The, right? the, the gradient metric is huge. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, and that's that's it's one of the <laughs> yeah that's one of like the drawbacks of the neural networks that you know there is a the you need a lot of data also to to like to tune this properly and mm, it is costly. It is costly because uh, so, so this is what is called like the, this optimization no, is what is called uh, uh, um, the bad word propagation no? because, because you do you, I mean, you do this gradient, you know, layer by layer, right? You're updating the weights according to this formula, right? And then again, now we, we go forward uh, evaluation again to see how much we improve and then you can go back so how many times you go back well uh, that's one param another parameter you know how many and that's what they in computer science they call the epochs you know how many epochs you do so an epoch is like a forward evaluation compute your optimal uh, values for your parameters by back propagating you know, and then again, and that, so that, that iteration going forward and backward is that one epoch, right? And then you can do this, you know, so, so you will see in the reports of people that do deep learning, you know, I have done my machine, have used whatever, 100 epochs, you know, and, and there's another thing that they talk, and the learning, learning rate, what's the learning rate is this valuator that you have chosen, right? Okay, so those are all the things that you should report. Well, that, that's uh, like a rule of thumb. You do it, and you see. Oh, okay, I'm getting. You know, now my, now I, I, my, my, I'm learning. My, my, I, I, I seem to have discovered what the map is between my x and y's, right? And then I use it to predict, and then I report like nice predictions on, on data that I have done seen, right? But I, I want to like what I want you to take away is that, you know, uh, the neural network paradigm consists of this forward evaluation, you know, where you uh, select weights and bias and evaluate through all the uh, layers, you know, until you get the output. You have a measure the quality of your approximation and then a backward propagation. 
on, on this scheme is where people have done improvement. You may say, well, you can do improvement of how do I measure the quality? I use mean square error, but people can use like mutual information, no? So from and other more uh, refined ways of measuring, you know, how much uh, loss you're getting from this uh, estimation, right? Or ways of improving the the back propagation, ways of improving the you know the the, the grading descent, right? So. And, and besides variations on the same model that, well, I have a, I, I've been composing this through linear regressions and applying certain nonlinear functions, no? But these are my activation functions. So you can improve on proposing certain families of activation function. So uh, it is important, this part is that with this scheme, we get this universality of neural network, which says that basically with uh, one layer neural network with activation function of the type sigmoid or heavy side, which are a squashing uh, function, you know, can approximate any, you know, uh, deliver the, uh, any function, any continuous and, and one time deli deliverable function, differentiable function, you know, uh, with any accuracy. This is like a, a res this should resemble the, the stone bias trust approximation theory. So you got that. And, and here's an intuition that I stole from a talk by Bruno Despre that I saw years ago and I saw that it was pretty nice intuition. Assuming that F is uh, differentiable, no, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, no, you can express F by this integral and I expand my integration uh, domain to all the real line by multiplying by the heavy side, right? And then I uh, approximate the integral by sums and approximate the heavy side by a sigmoidal function, right? And doing this stepwise, this step delta. So you see, that this has the form, you know, of a one layer neural network. Oh. <laughs> Easy, <laughs> you like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the the paper by Hornick and all is, uh, you, say, you know, it falls into uh, function, you know, uh, functional analysis and they go into whatever Hilbert space and so on. It's very complicated, but you know, I really love this huge argument that tells you, give you a good intuition of why it's so that what is what is the power of neural networks? No, that actually you can approximate very well any uh, differentiable function, all right? And this can be extended to whatever functions in Hilbert space and so on. Of course, the is it integrated or differentiable? Yeah, it should be differentiable yeah. function. Yeah. Okay. Differentiable, uh, uh, but I'm, but I'm sure. I mean, you can also extend it to integrable and so on. And the, of course, like you know, where is the the small letter? You know, it's like provided that you know, with the one hidden layer is large enough. All right. So we, what means large enough that it has like what well, 400, 500 neurons, which means in practice, yeah, you need, you need a lot of time or, or a lot of computational power to like you know update do this forward evaluation, backward uh, computation, right? So keep that in mind because this is something that then has been used, you know, in, you know, in what's coming. So now I do a big jump. How do I move to like neural ODE? So first let's look at this part. Uh, an improvement of my residual of my neural network is this residual neural network where in my, you see my, the function that I'm learning, which is, uh, remember a linear regression, you know, remember it's a, it's, it was this linear regressions, you know, um, and which I apply then uh, a fee, right? Uh, one of the problem is that sometimes, you know, your chosen weights and bias can make this, and, 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 and if this is like a sigmoidal function, 
can make these values too small. And then, you know, the predictions start degrading, you know, going to zero, right? So mostly with dependable data, like, like uh, time series, right? So some guys say, well, why don't you, you know, if this is, you know, uh, why don't you add, you know, what you already know from the previous step, right? So this is my function on the hidden node at time at, at layer T, right? And then why don't you add, in order to compute the next layer, you know, uh, this is the, the, the now five will, will activate, you know, this, uh, this value, all right? And then you add the information that you already have. All right, so at least you guarantee that your the function that you learn at least you know it, it starts from the identity. Okay, so that's the residual neural network where you see an improvement is that add the information that you already having you know layer by layer the information that you already have computed at that layer you know add it to the for the when you compute the next uh, layer. Okay, and then these guys Chen and co-authors. You know, this said that, oh, look, but this then now, if I, you know, pass this term subtracting to the left side, what I have is that the F that I'm trying to learn is not a map from X to Y, but the a rate of change, right? Okay, and then from a rate of change, say, okay, and what about if like, you know, increase my number of layers, you know, continuously, right? And then I'm actually learning the differential, you know, of the function, okay? So the neural network, and this is how the neural ODE comes to, you know, to well, life that are here, it's changed as all neural ODE, all right? Uh, where they said, okay, this is like an extension of a residual neural network where instead of like precisely looking at the uh, rate of change in discrete steps, you know, do it at continuous steps, Right, and then actually, what I have is. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I think there is something to do. Did I share your screen? Oh. So from the very beginning, I think nobody can see. Uh, how do you do that? Stop it. Share screen. I didn't realize. Share. Ah, Enrique Cabana is coming. Okay. I share my screen. All right. Who's back there Sorry. connecting to audio? People can see my screen now? Yes. Uh, no, wait. Sorry uh. for people who will see this. Uh -huh. uh, welcome to Enrique. Oh, but now it's like um, it's okay. everybody's like on. Um, if I share my screen, why? Uh, this way, you can make minimization. Okay, that's okay. Huh? Don't worry, it's okay. Put this Here, uh huh. Uh, let's see if I. There. So people now can see my screen? Yes. All right, so I do a big, uh, a quick review. <laughs> so this is a neural network, right? This is a for a one layer neural network, you know? So it's with one of the pieces in neural networks do a forward evaluation, all right? Here is the collection of possible activation functions that you may have. Uh, deep neural network is just a repeat repetition of this idea where I, uh, I iteratively, I compute, you know, linear regressions at, of all the elements of one layer and apply the values to the next layer and then uh, pass that value to an, a nonlinear function. That's my phi here, right? And then I'll, and the output then of all these compositions goes through uh, another nonlinear function, which is psi, and that's my, my that's my my output. All right, so just 
uh, this, that's what we call the forward evaluation. And then to tune the weight, we do a backward propagation where we compute the gradient of this cost <laughs> function, right? And update uh, by gradient descent, okay? So uh, that's important to know what I want you to get, take from here is that the general paradigm of a, or a scheme of a neural network is that we have a forward evaluation in the way I just described it. We have a computation of the uh, required approximation and then we do gradient to update layer by layer, you know, which is the backward propagation, all my uh, parameters. No? My theta is the collection of weights and bias that I need for computing these linear regressions, you know, step by step. Okay, and so, and we have this kind of stone bias theorem that tells you that this kind of uh, neural networks uh, are can approximate any differentiable function, okay? And here is an intuitive uh, proof of that. And how do we go there from a neural ODE is that if we improve our neural model by adding layer by layer the information that we already have computed, then this looks at we are then learning the, the rate of change. Okay? And then if we do this uh, more intensively, you know, in a continuous way, we arrive to actually learning the differential. Okay. Okay. So, but now my forward evaluation. So, how do you will evaluate, you know, this? Uh, to this continuum of layers. No, it's actually now an initial value problem, all right? So an initial value problem where you like, sort of like uh, your value X is the value at some initial uh, time T zero, which now is another parameter, right? Zero. And you have to like then evaluate this and to a certain time Tn, right? Uh, I mean, this and you, so your function is actually the, the integral, you know, of, of, uh, of this. And, and how do you go about this? Well, you, instead of like not doing now, I mean, now I don't have a, a, an explicit form for my F. I just have a implicit, you know, differential equation, and I, which is given by data, right? And I just apply some. Mm, black box ODE solver, no? That we have a whole collection from people that does numerical analysis and to get, you know, to compute this from data. So you apply any black box uh, for, and so just to fix some ideas, for example, apply Euler method, right? Uh, this will be from my data, uh, every, uh, it will be applied by, I mean, uh, decide on some, some epsilon step, right? Where I then, uh, uh, the next uh, value uh, of set uh, time at the, uh, the layer t plus epsilon will be computed this way. So we have, uh, uh, and we, I mean, we, we have a numerical methods to compute that. I mean, I'm sorry, the Euler method is a numerical method, but that, this, is, this is very, very uh, heavy. You know, and it's not very unstable. Yeah, it's not very unstable, sorry. Okay, so that's where you use more sophisticated black box ODE solvers, right? Uh, so just the idea is that now my forward evaluation is to solve this initial value problem where my function F that are, uh, are learning, let's call it the, the, the ODE function, or the, the, the function that I have to integrate. Okay, so and so, what is the contribution of chain and all? Is that well now? Whatever your cost function is to evaluate how good is your approximation, no? It involves you know the optimization of this uh, integral, right? And so, I mean, if you do this by gradient descent, you know. This is going to be very heavy and, and, and yeah, because you don't have an explicit form now for your, for your F, all right? And you have to approximate those 
the those gradients of this the, of this integral somehow. So the thing is that uh, what they uh, propose is that the the appropriate way of doing something like the backward propagation or gradient descent is to use uh, Pontiac Green's uh, uh, adjoint method. Okay. So remember, this time, besides uh, the, the parameters are whatever parameters of the involved in the ODE solver for my F. And you know, the, what would be my initial time, my final time where I'm going to, going to my integration and my initial point you know, for, for the initial value problem. Okay, so we have to compute all these, at least all these four gradients. And, and let's take, for example, the gradient for the, the theta parameters, right? So we, what we want to compute is the minimum of theta for the cost function evaluated at the, I mean, beginning at the, in, at the end, I mean, we're doing this backwards, not from the end, I mean, the evaluation will be in T0, right? And of this uh, differential, equation and so just i did some little steps so if i compute this lagrangian okay uh so you can easily see but if you do by integration by parts and apply the chain rule of differentiation to this you arrive at this expression where you the the gradient with respect to theta is this uh, interval equation where uh, it appears this term, which is called the adjoint state, which is the solution of this uh, initial value problem. All right. And further algebraic manipulation gives you that the cost with respect to theta is the solution of a time T0 of, of this initial value problem, where uh, the initial time, I mean, at the final time Tn, the, the the adjoint, sorry, is zero. Thank you. <laughs> the adjoint is zero, and the, and here is the form of your of your differential equation. So there are methods. I'm not an expert on this, you know. So, but there is already built building, you know, lots of uh, numerical methods to do this, and actually in an efficient way, right? So, where, are, where was I here? Okay. No similar calculation will yield that you, the cost with respect to the other parameters, you know, the, the value at the initial time, the initial time and the rest is, is all, are all initial value problems corresponding to a joint state at that time, C0. So if you are define the augmented state ST of being of composed of these three adjoints, you know, the concatenation of these adjoints, uh, uh, this is, like the general uh, or the substitute for the back propagation no? is to solve this uh, initial value problem on the adjoints. Okay, so this is all in the appendix of the, of the chain at all. And this is actually their contribution to say this is the proper way of doing back propagation. So that's why I stress the fact that, you know, the whole scheme of neural networks is like you do forward evaluation. You compute how good is your approximation, and then you optimize doing some backward uh, uh, computation, right? Uh, or back propagation, right? In the case of neural networks, it was kind of easy because the whole function is explicit, is this composition of nonlinear function with linear regression, which you know, and so you compute, you can compute uh, partial derivatives of that and the gradient of that in an explicit form. But when you move this into a continuum of layers, you know, they, this is what the neural ODE model gives you, right? Now, uh, uh, my forward evaluation is an initial value problem and optimization has to be done on, on considering that, no? You have a, an initial value problem that you have to solve like a, a stepwise. And the way of doing it is, is using this, or the way of doing it efficiently is doing it uh, using this theory of the adjoint, okay? So, uh, and here's my, the, that's what I just said, a summary, right? So forward evaluation initial value problem and training optimization is applying the adjoint sensitivity method. No? The space complexity of for the adjoint is constant, you know? You don't need to be saving, you know, 
uh, if you do the gradient you, for each step, for each step you do backwards, you have to be save, you know, the, the, the compute, the updated values of your weights and bias. No, this is not something that you have to do in the adjoint method. So in that sense, it's more efficient than doing a gradient descent. And the time is more or less uh, proportional to, to using gradient descent. So, so in, in that sense, it's more efficient. Okay, so uh, where am I now? Okay. okay, so the advantage is, as I said, memory savings is an adaptive computation because, uh, well, you, you will adapt how many you know steps you will do of this adjoint is something that can be adapted from the from the data. Uh, is a con uh, well, it works well with continuous time series models. The drawbacks is like since we are always, I mean, implicitly we are always solving problems that are solutions of a differential equation, and so should have also uh, inverse. So we. We're really learning only homeomorphisms, no? Not just uh, so you have to. I mean, the function that we're learning have are continuous, and their inverse are also continuous. Okay, uh, the speed. Well, we haven't gained much in speed, right? Okay, so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, a question. Do you share the current page or something else? I don't see the same on my screen and uh, on the web web. No. Sharing is post. Sharing is post. Bring your share window. Okay. Okay. But I'm, I'm not sharing my form. Uh, we are screen sharing now. Oh, yes. Okay. I guess maybe I was going too fast and sharing is post. Okay. Is this good? No, goes up. Resume sharing. Look. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, that's okay. It works. Resume. Resume part of the link. But it says sharing is post. Ah. Uh -huh. okay. This one Sorry. now. Uh, let's let's see. Okay, when I don't put it into a, a full screen, so maybe I maybe I leave it this way. If I put it in full screen, it seems that it, it okay. now you now. Okay, so we work this way. Yeah. yeah. What's all this chucky chucky? Somebody like talking. Huh? Somebody taking pictures. Yeah. Okay. Don't, I mean, the, the, the slides are available. Don't take pictures. Yes, they are online. <laughs> they are available. And they, so, okay. Okay, now, okay. Now, remember the universal approximation properties of, of phi. So, uh, the traditional approach used by most authors is that actually, you know, the since my function f, you know, is given implicitly, and I have to solve this initial value problem to do my forward evaluation and so on, you know, what they do is like, well, since neural networks, one-layer neural networks, are universal, you know, I can then just, you know, substitute a neural network and try to from data, you know, learn f, and that's what I will use for my uh, my initial value problem. So instead of using the, the, the raw data, I use, you know, a uh, neural network, uh, the data filtered to a neural network. Uh, so I, I mean, as I said, I, and here's where myself and co-author kind of like, yeah. being like this, because I mean, I mean, the whole point of this model is, is kind of lost. I mean, we're circling back to using neural network with all the problem that it has about all the data, all the amount of data that you need in order to uh, tune this model, right? Uh, and sort of talk is with, I mean, the, I mean, the original model is what I call a neural network with, a, with an ODE inside, 
Most washing that will say that washing machine with fuzzy logic inside. You remember that? <laughs> so this is a neural. So so the original model is a neural network with the OD inside. So bringing it, it, so what's what's the advantage? Well, you have a, the, the 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 full power of the neural network, but now all the inner computation should be substituted by you know all the machinery that we already have collected from years of work of people in numerical analysis or for doing, you know, for solving ODE, right? So, so, so computer scientists in, and the authors of the paper themselves, you know, instead of doing that, I say, let me search for you no know, uh, powerful ODE scholars, you know, for uh, my situation. They say, well, the problem is that when I have data, like data that is not numerical, uh, but might be torn numerical, but it represents like images, you know, I, I don't know, you know, what kind of system of differential equation I can associate to it, right? And then I just say, well, plug in a neural network because I know this is a, that's an approximator and uh, my, in my approximator, and it works. And it sort of, it kind of works, right? That's the, but the, given the fact that it's, <laughs> No, but but it's still, you know, then the the you have the still the problems of like you know mm, uh, heavy computation, lots of time. So the results are not, uh, although people are uh, reporting like mm, great results. The the I mean in the practice they they're not very practical, right? So, and here is our small proposal, joint work with Carlos Ortiz and a student. That run. This is, this is like, no, let's substitute our ordinary differential equations, you know, by this system of n ordinary, very simple system, ordinary differential equation, right? Uh, where the set, you know, will be the solution. Now, this cannot be seen here, will be the solution, you know, of this initial value problem for some family of uh, differential equations. And now where the interesting part comes in. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, the, the, what we propose to substitute for, you know, for the differential equation inside the neural network, no? a real uh, dynamical system, okay, which we can compute the solution easily. And it, it is composed of a, uh, of a function, which is the solution of this system, where this L could be what the dynamists are looking for, you know, the El Santo Grial, which is like, you know, uh, some dynamical system, which is universal in the sense of being able to uh, approach any other uh, dynamical system. And I know there are many papers on this. I mean, this has, there isn't something definite, but there are still, there are at least three families of dynamical systems, you know, which are universal in the sense that if you have any system of differential equation, by doing some algebraic transformation, it can be transformed into a lockable term system, or it can be transformed to a Riccati system or what are known as the S systems, right? And, uh, so we take all the, and these has this as very you know uh, concrete forms you know these are uh, co uh, real coefficients right and you see that this is of uh, the order of this differential equation is of order one whereas this Riccati is an extension of lockable terra you know and and has order two at most and we have numerical methods you know powerful to to solve this systems. So uh, it is not known if any system of differential equation can be reduced, ordinary system of uh, differential equation can be reduced to one of these, but in practice they do. I mean there are a lot of papers by physicists that are showing this kind of equation. So we, what we did is like, okay, we're going to uh, test, you know, our neural OD, you know, with Three, uh, with these three systems and see which one of these, you know, uh, at least in practice, looks as, as if they were universal in some sense. So we begin by trying to learn very, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, real functions, just very simple real functions, like you know, families of all like analytical functions like constants, identity, polynomials, signs, uh, trigonometric, exponential, exponential, and, and logarithmic, right? And what we're going to do is like you know, uh, apply neural ODEs to learn this function from data and play with the uh, order, you know, of the, of my mm, system of differential equation or, or of two equations, five up to ten. See if this influences any way, and using log uh, and using the log table Terra Riccati OS system. So, uh, so and here are the results. You know what this slide is showing is the computation time to approximate the, my different functions. Uh, first thing to know is that the Riccati system is the only one that is able to approach the sine function. All of all of the other just exploded. The, they, we gave you know all you know, all the time we gave them they, they, they did not were able to like have learned sign of three so Riccati at least in this sense is winning right so green is Riccati uh, red is lockable Terra and this system so so remember what, what I'm doing is that the, the ODE inside my neural neural network is one of these systems and I'm trying to learn these functions okay and looking at the time you have in the y-axis, okay? So uh, that's the performance. Uh, and well, you see that Riccati actually does well in time with respect to the rest. And besides that, it's the only one that's able to compute the sign. The, the, the box is like, well, the mean and the, the, the well, it's a, is a box of like what was the mean time after many runs? You know, yeah, yeah, we simulated many times and see, okay, you know, what the error, the error, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, exactly, the error. So, like for x squared, I don't know why the error like gets very, very wide, exactly. And n is equal to two, in this case, n is equal to two. The size of the mm -hmm. of the of the yes mm -hmm. yeah uh, and yeah yeah okay yeah we uh, okay that's that's your answer yeah so okay now increasing now let's look if we increase the the order of the of the system I mean, of the of my system of differential equation for so this is for lockable terra uh, so red is for a system with two equations, uh, green is for five equations, blue, uh, blue is for 10. What we see is like, I think uh, five gets you more. Of course, here is not sign. Remember, Locke Voltero was not able to like learn the sign function. Oh, no. no? So, what about the constant? Function? Ah. Here, okay. they all do very well. Uh, in general, I, which color? I think this is the blue, red, and green. So I think, like more or less, you know, size five is uh, is sufficient to, to compute. You know, it look. I mean, here for like uh, this inverse, even like having greater size, you know, it blows up the time. Well, it goes beyond. Uh, I don't know uh, what scale is this. It's sixty. Minutes, no, 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 seconds, no, no. Okay. Uh, and here is for the Riccati. Riccati is able to compute sign. And we see, oh, here, yeah, that for size five, no, we get more or less. I mean, if you do, if you increase the size, you don't gain much. That's maybe the general uh, conclusion. No? Increasing the size beyond 10 or no, you don't, you know, you don't gain much. Okay, so good news, right? Yeah, you know, you we can stay within you know a small size, you know, and Riccati at least computes all this fast, right? And this is for the S system. We see same idea, but that increasing the size if that if you no gain. No, that's the general conclusion, right? And well, that's it. And now we have like you know. Uh, 
Now for, I think this is for the Riccati. Yeah, this is sign. So, so at the several iterations, you know how the Riccati starts approaching the, the two function sign, which is in green, you know, so actually this, this was the student and, and he had some nice simulation, which I don't have here. Well, you could see the curve like, wow. As, you know, as you iterate more how it starts approaching and then eventually nails the, the function or it learns the function. At, depending on how how much you know you are tight with the with the error so increasing that you know you really nail the the, the function sign you know with that uh and that's it so the figures i'll show you this approximation for the for the ricardi system you know how well it approximates you know visually okay uh so conclusion is that okay we this is like a first step on uh, trying to de do real near neural ODE in the sense of having a neural network with a ODE inside and use, you know, uh, instead of substituting, doing that trick of like, well, using again a neural network to, to approximate the differential equation due to the universality, you know, try to use one of those families of system of differential equations that are not that are, well, not that are suspected to be universal. In this sense, Riccate seems to be the winner, okay? So of course, this is a very uh, basic experiment because we have only learned uh, uh, numerical function of, of one dimension, one variable. Uh, so we need to extend this to, uh, to functions with many variables and also go into like the type of benchmark problems that uh, people like in computer science, which is like, uh, you know, uh, detecting, classifying images. So we have to like compress our images into some numerical values and so on. So can you comment on the stiffness of the equation? Well, the stiffness, the thing of these equations, you know, uh, are, it, what it means is that their, their numerical methods are very unstable. That, uh, Depending on the initial value, you know, it might run uh, further or less. Yeah. See, yeah, that's what we know. That uh, remember, one of the parameters here is like, okay, where, where was, what is the initial, what initial value do I take, you know, and the initial point, and how, what, and my final uh, value also where I start my back, my adjoint method. So the thing is that uh, numerical. Uh, at least, at least the, the same adjoint, just as it is, is not very uh, stable. So, so there are other methods that seems uh, more robust. Rosenblum and somebody as I remember, but we weren't able to like implement it into the Python uh, uh, packages that it was used. So, so yeah. So other numerical methods should be. Uh, and people actually are researching and working on like adaptive adjoint method or augmented adjoint method and whatnot to, to actually get you know, over these problems. Okay, so there's much research on the method of doing the back propagation, and and we are proposing to like you know keep you know the the ODE inside to be a truly ODE and try to solve it using you know exploring the numerical methods because the results from uh, the the way people is doing and so I collected here in honor to uh, my host you know uh, a collection of papers that uses the what I call the twisted model you know the which is the uh, the ODE with a neural network inside right and you can go into this web page of of Sebastian Cole, where they, they they tell you how to train these and and with with data from uh, weather from India and try to predict you know the weather using neural ODE. More more interesting is the uh, the kind of work that and, and this was like my first approach to neural ODE. The, by these people from MIT, the Dan Descartes, Chris Lacaucas, where, you know, with COVID, they propose this model 
where you actually uh, you have a, and, and actually they don't call this neural ODE. They call it augmented systems. You know, with neural network. I mean, they're they're truly calling this uh, that dynamical system augmented with a neural network, which means that you uh, actually this is this link is yeah. what they do is actually uh, propose. Uh, the typical uh, epidemic model, I just want to show you the equations. The typical epidemic model of uh, R, uh, RSI, El CIR, right? So this is your typical model of that we, we all surely during the COVID became experts on. So like the suspected, the infected and the recovered, you know, and these are the rate of change from one compartment to another. And now they want to include there the, the people that goes, goes into quarantine, quarantine, right? So, and, and here is the, you know, the, the graphics, no? the, you have the suspected that with some certain rate might become infected. And if they are infected, they are put into quarantine, All right? So computing, you know, the rate of, people that uh, goes from infected to quarantine and then after recover it, that uh, compartment, you know, is computed with a neural network. And so it will look like this. So you have your differential equation for the susceptible, the infected, recover it, and then the people that are goes into quarantine you see, here's where you plug in your neural network that you learn from the data that you have from the infected and the, I can't remember what was the topic. Oh, well, no, I mean, these are the, the, the parameters, not the weights and so on. So that's, uh, that's really, I mean, they don't call it neural ODE, but it, but, it's, but it kind of, you know, comes back to this idea is that you have the neural ODE and now you have plug in in the ODE part, you have plug in a neural network to compute. I mean, here it fits well, it's reasonable, but I, I did work on that with a student. The students are very frustrated. I mean, these guys report now these nice graphics about the evolution of this compartment, right? With the data, if I try, and we reproduce that, and we couldn't go beyond, you know, the first days, as they have it here, these are like the first 80 days of, you know, when the COVID spread, in 2020, I mean, if you go beyond that, then the, the, the all this curve like start kind of get horizontal because, mm, I mean, their I mean their predictive power is completely lost. It's very weak model in that sense. So, uh, and I mean, there's not really updating you can get on that. Uh, and so, because you need a lot of uh, uh, data to train that neural network. That's my, that's the point here. So. The, the proposal is cool. It looks like, wow, uh, interesting. Uh, but, you know, in practice, I mean, this is all they have. And they, I think they, they buried this project and all more. <laughs> so, 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 but, uh, well, but uh, maybe there's things, things that can be done in, you know, for, you know, for the ecological project that Professor Dukan has in mind using some of these. Uh, ideas of neural ODE, and so we might look at the uh, other research paper on climate modeling and and other. Okay, okay, so that's it. Oh well, no last last thing that I leave to you is like uh, tools. Uh, these guys were Caucas for this project of the uh, CIR with neural ODE. They actually develop a nice package for the Julia uh, program, which is this diff equates flux, which has you know uh, all the software for solving uh, real uh, complex uh, differential equation, you know, or methods for solving differential equation, and which incorporates also uh, ways of defining your neural network. So your defining neural network is like a function that says layout, and you can say number of neurons, number of uh, 
uh, uh, whatever, uh, and how many layers you want, uh, the learning rate, and in in incorporate uh, the sort of differential equation and solve this differential equation. So here's a, uh, in, in the Python program, which is what Julia is based on, and it's running very fast. Uh, I mean, this is better, I think, than TensorFlow, which is the other competitor, right? Okay, I mean, TensorFlow, I think, from Google, and uh, Julia, I also expect better by guys in the MIT, so I think this is, this is more robust and, and has all the many numerical uh, packages already programmed to solve, I mean, adjoin and all that, so, so. I mean, it's not that you're going to start from zero uh, trying to implement these things. Uh, so, well, this is what I'm trying to learn and follow. I have students that are dealing with this package. Uh, and that's it. Okay, uh, now I'm over. Questions? Comments? Just a curiosity, this Raskoskas is not the same uh, as the one from Vilnius. Who? This, who, who? There is, I have a friend whose name is Raskoskas. It's actually the same name. Ah. And he is in Vilnius. And, uh, no, no, this guy is this. This is him. No, in MIT. Chris. Yeah, he's, he's quite young, actually. Yeah. Yes, I, I looked at him. Yeah. His page is a very strong. Page. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty really strong on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions? Or question from people out there in the remote? Uh, I see in machine learning, um, when you have many layers, you have a good result for production. Uh, so, I'm um, their uh, problem is overfitting. Yes. So I don't know if, if your problem, uh, you, do you consider overfitting? Yeah, overfitting, yeah, it's always present. That's why uh, you, that, that one of the, the parameters to control the overfitting is this learning rate, you know, how that's why it's called the learning rate, you know, this, this, constant eta that you put in your improvement, no? So you try not to be, that's a way of trying to, I mean, that your improvement, try not to be then so good, yeah. But indeed, yeah, uh, if, it, I mean, it also depends on how many epochs you do this, right? So uh, it is, I mean, definitely this is something that is, is inescapable. You always might incur in overfitting and you have to control on that. And that's why, I mean, you train in, in a piece of data and then test that on unseen data, right? And then you measure, you know, precisely what's the, the, the error in with the unseen data with the seen data and that, uh, the, that rate between these two quantities give you an idea of how much overfitting or unfitting you might incur on. And then you say, well, this might not work very well. But yeah, that's, I mean, I don't have the, oh, I don't know, like a rule uh, in order to like prevent this. And I don't think it has nothing to do with like number of layers, if you put many layers or so on. Yeah. So we don't know no, and in fact, the universal property is only known formally from a mathematical point of view for one layer, right? So I can guarantee that whatever my function I like to learn, I, I, I can I can get it, you know, with a one layer. The thing is that okay, one layer, wow, many what a million nodes, you know, <laughs> that's the thing, right? Uh, but, but, but the proof, you know, from machine machining and functional analysis, it actually worked with, with one layer. There are uh, equivalent or similar uh, theories for deep network, but it's always, you know, uh, under certain conditions, you know. Um, yeah, so if you get into that, you know, you may 
actually, I believe that studying that uh, formally, we, are, we have begun reading on that. Maybe you get uh, the, uh, the a formal relation between, you know, at least like what number of nodes so, uh, against this uh, good approximation of, you know, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's behind this, there's a, uh, a big uh, math. Uh, but I haven't got into that completely. I think it's, it falls into like approximation theory, functional analysis, and there's only finite time. Yes. You said that you can only approximate deterministic fluxes somewhere. Deterministic. So you only can learn deterministic functions. Well, yeah, because the whole process is, uh, you know, is is deterministic, no? Yep. But, uh, uh, I said but there that. are no deterministic functions in nature. Everything is random. Maybe we should be a differential the equation. Yeah, the differential yeah, equation. Can you put a stochastic differential equation? Ah. Uh -huh. I mean, can you add the noise? Yes, it should improve. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, okay, but I don't know if you. you uh huh. Ah, but uh, okay, but I. Okay, but you're talking, but, but um, okay, but you're talking two different things now. You're saying like, well, if I perturb my Riccati with some uh, uh, stochastic noise, uh, but I don't know. But but you're talking about also the the universal approximation theorem, which talks about just neural networks. No, I don't know. I don't have something mm -hmm. for neural ODE. Okay. okay. Uh, which goes back to like so the we uh, okay. We have to. I mean, you're talking two different things. One thing is the universal approximation, which is very interesting. And uh, again, going back to her question, you know. This is also being uh, research for like deep neural network, but even like, okay, before going into like the neural ODE, you no, know, the residual neural network, because the residual neural network also has this universal property. I, I think it does. I have a paper that, you know, it, 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 it has some, under some certain conditions, you also have this universal property. Then from there, you may jump into TV. And then uh, I don't know what happened if you add stochasticity. So you see, so I don't know if it, if, if it applies to, uh, to like um, uh, random uh, or function with randomness and randomness now. And so again, yeah, uh, my whole process is, is, is deterministic sort of mapping I'm learning, you know. Somehow, well, it's a it's a deterministic approximation. Maybe that would okay. be the right uh, word. It's a deterministic approximation. So whatever is random in the function is is lost, and maybe that's precisely where we fail. Uh, yeah, in fact, this paper which I was looking at with some students, the ones I proposed at the end. Uh, if you read the title, climate modeling with neural diffusion oh, equations. These guys, mm -hmm. right, supposedly, this, the, uh, substitute the, the ODE by a, a stochastic differential equation. But I think my feeling well, by reading this, you know, uh, diagonally is that uh, they, they do it wrong because, okay, for the because uh, the, for the back propagation, they're using the same uh, gradient the same. And I would say, well, you should adapt it, you know, at least some gradient the same to, 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 uh, to a diffusion equation. No? I mean, compute uh, the differential or of a stochastic function of a, yeah, of a stochastic, a stochastic, yeah, a stochastic differential equation, not just a simple uh, derivative. Uh, so I, yeah, yeah. I don't, so I don't see any of that on the paper. They just propose the model, and they do get a forward evaluation using, you know, the diffusion equation. Okay, 
But when, when they go back to optimizing, they go back to the gradient descent, the regular gradient descent, treating that as a as differential, a regular differential equation, not, not a stochastic differential equation. So uh, I don't know. So I need a, a clever student to like get into that. So, uh, yeah, to improve that. So yeah, uh, yeah that's, but that's the model, that's the idea. And it's your turn, we have double session today. <laughs> Okay, we, we have one more question. Maybe we make a, a short stop. Yeah. Like uh, mm -hmm. until 4 p.m. And, uh, and, okay. and uh, I will speak afterwards, okay? So I stop recording at the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't stop the session.
unmute. Okay. Okay. Now. Thank you to, thank you to Enrique and, and Victor. Oh okay. oh. That's okay. okay. Well, uh, I guess I didn't say anything that it's not already written. Okay. And better people don't hear what I had to say. So you didn't say bad things against the, no the against none anymore. of them. Okay. But against functional data, I did okay. say quite nasty things. So, uh, well, maybe if we have a continuous model and we can think that our data come from our differentiable phenomenon, then maybe knowing the derivatives and second derivatives can help uh, decide whether a set is close or not to another set. So that's why, uh oh, but now I've lost the mouse. Okay. So the idea is here to use semi-metrics, semi-metrics and uh, uh, well, a semi-metric is in fact something that behaves exactly like a measure, uh, like a metric, except that uh, when we say that the distance between two objects is zero, is not that not, not necessarily mean that the object is uh, itself. The distance between x and y can be zero without x being y. And that's that's the, the semi-metric thing. So the otherwise it works uh, like an affinity thing and the, it, the triangular inequality works. So uh, that's what we're going to use. And a nice semi-metric would be, well, so we'll have distance or things like that, that use not only the distance between the curves, but the distance between the derivatives. Okay, so uh, why are we going to use this semi-metrics? Well, to plug them into uh, density estimator, essentially. So what we are going to do is to do non-parametric regression for functional data and uh, doing classification is doing a regression. It's just that, uh, so we, we, we need to know what the, the regression operator is. The regression operator would be well, we have a, a, a target variable, which is the y. And uh, this y depends on several continuous variables. Um, this can be either the x and the y. The y can be a function, or it can be a scalar response. And the covariates can also be functions or covariates doesn't matter. And uh, well, the regression operator is the conditional expectation of y given x. And that's why mm, classification is exactly the same. You just have to compute a probability, which is the expectation of the indicator function of the states, and that's it. And uh, well, this can be estimated by mm, this, which is exactly uh, an extension of Nadaraya Watson density estimation. So this is uh, y times the uh, some kernel computed on a linear regression of the, of the covariates uh, divided by exactly the same except not multiplied by y. So this is uh, Nadaraya Watson estimator uh, put in this context. Nadaraya Watson uses uh, the distance between y and, and the observed, just the norm of the difference of y and, and x. So this is uh, Nadaraya Watson's uh, estimator. And it's a consistent estimator. It works well. Uh, well, that's uh, 
require some regularity conditions. Of course, everything requires some regularity, but in this case, it's not so terrible. Uh, we need the regression operator to be continuous. Uh, so uh, we require some things. Uh, we also need that, uh, essentially what we need is that if we take a ball in one point of the curve, then there is a whole ball of the curve where all the other curves are in there. So that, that's what we, essentially what we need. And uh, well, that's it. So uh, we have that estimator. If we, if we ask for this, then we have that, uh, we have convergence in probability and almost surely, but this is kind of stronger. Okay, so we have a nice estimator of the regression function and that's what we do. And the classification problem is exactly the same, except that what we are computing is a conditional probability of uh, a class. So uh, just writing that conditional probability as the expectation of the indicator function, then here we are. We, we get to the, to the previous problem. So regularity conditions are roughly the same as before. And well, we can then uh, estimate consistently both the regression and the classification uh, methods. And that's, we, what the, that's what we will do. And then, okay, so here we need to use uh, one of those semi-metrics. We can use a different semi-metric for each of the variables we have. If they are of different nature, then we can somehow decide what metric to use which we didn't, in fact, but we could, we could have. Okay, and we have, we, we've tried uh, only these three uh, distances, which are uh, L2 distance between the curves, Hausdorff distance, and Wasserstein's distance. Wasserstein's distance is of a completely different nature from those two. And uh, it might look weird. Wasserstein distance comes from uh, optimal transport. So it's a distance between probability measures. Um, okay, and uh, the thing is, uh, one of my co-authors has used a uh, house of distance in classifying very rough curves. What she had were, it was a, an applied paper uh, where people were asked to complete uh, some kind of Google forms or, or something like that. And what they recorded were the movements of the mouse, of the mouse of the computer, of the computer mouse, the movements of people made on the mouse when answering the, 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 the whatever they were asking. Okay, so it apparently worked well, but they wondered whether another kind of distance would have done better. So that's why they proposed why not use uh, L2 distance or Wasserstein distance. I think it was not appropriate in that case, but. Okay, so we tried these in three different contexts. And I hoped at the beginning that the smoother the curve, the more reasonable L2 distance would perform. And it was not the case, not exactly the case. So I don't know, it intrigued me why it didn't work better always. So uh, the, we used uh, three data sets in order to, to do this. It was a work of a student, so we couldn't put him to do much stuff. <coughs> the three data sets we used were, 
Okay, classifying functional data, which were distances from the center of a picture to the, to the contour. And there were images of uh, birds and chickens. So how could, you, can you distinguish a bird from a chicken just by looking at the curves of uh, these observations? And uh, well, in this case, clearly Wasserstein's distance worked better. This is the accuracy uh, in the prediction. Accuracy is the number of times you do well when you know what you're doing. And in this case, it's reasonable that Wasserstein's distance worked well. well uh, these were scaled, so uh, total mass was one, and we are trying to convert uh, a chicken into a, into a bird or vice versa. So it's a transport problem in the end. So it really worked better Wasserstein's distance than either L2 or Hertzberg <laughs> distance. So in this case, uh, there was a, a clear win in, what, in, in, in choosing one over the other. Um, what was the benchmark here? So uh, people that do classification of images, how, what uh, accuracy do they get? Well, normally <coughs> they get roughly this 90%. So we are not doing better than benchmarks, but uh, clearly Wasserstein works way better than either of the two other things. But if you look at the data, they are not so rough. So, um, so L2 could have done better and it doesn't. So uh -huh. the, the images are like uh, a map of like uh, digits, uh, I mean, yeah, you, uh, no, you have the images and then you have the distances from the center of the image, the, 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 the center of mass of the image uh, to, the, to the contour. Okay, but how do you distinguish the contour? That's what I'm saying. That. How you, you, you embed the image into- these, these are the, what you have in the end. So you find the book. How you embed the image? Is that, is that, and such as in, in a square, and then yeah, the, mm -hmm. then whatever is not blank is is uh, part of the image. It's part of the contour. Part of okay. yeah. Okay. So you have to distinguish when you get like over a, a, a dark point. Mm -hmm. dark point then yeah, the and that that's what. And then you record only the distances. So I thought you had to work, you did a mapping. No, no, you don't. No. No, 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 just the, the distances. Mm -hmm. Would you, yeah, and, 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 but if you click there, you get the, the data set, so. Uh, uh, what else? Okay, so this is one of the examples. The other one was, oh, well, they did, was, uh, these are spoken digits. The, here is the frequency of the spoken of, uh, well, we only used three digits because uh, the computer power the, the student had was not so big. So we didn't use the 10 digits, but we had only three classes. And uh, of the, and we had uh, four predictors. And uh, well, that's what we had in this case. This spoken data sets were, well, again, uh, in this case, L2 wins, which again went against my idea of having uh, the smoother, the better L2 would work. Well, this is not smooth at all. L2 work better than anything else. And uh, again, here the benchmark was around 90%. So we are not that far from, 
from the benchmark. And finally, here, uh, regression. The idea here is these are, again, a famous data set, which consists on spectrometric curves of uh, NEAT. The name Tecator comes from the name of the machine that uh, chops the meat. So we have uh, fine pieces of meat chopped, and uh, then we have absorbances measured at different wavelengths. And what we have as a, we have the fat content of the piece of meat, which is the thing that we want to predict. And the water content, which is all, this is a scalar, water content is also a scalar. Uh, protein uh, was also a scalar. And what we had also was the spectrometric curve. So we had one functional uh, covariate, and then the other covariates were scalars. And what we wanted is, was to predict the, the quantity of fat. And the root mean square error of prediction, in this case, we're, well, we're all around the same, more or less. And uh, oh, this is an old version of my, of my transparencies, because I had here, uh, no, maybe I have it down here. Something with the where the bend. Oops. Uh, how do I go slightly? No, I can't. Whoop. Here. No, that's an old version. So I had here the, a paper with the benchmark. So the benchmark, different uh, machine learning methods on this data set produce root mean square errors between. Uh, 0.6, much better than this, and 2.5, much worse than this. So support vector machines, uh, neural networks, stuff like that. Uh, the errors go between 0.6 and 2.5. So we are doing better here than 2.5, but um, much worse than 0.6. So I see no improvement in using this as functional data. The only thing is that, well, after, I didn't do the calculations. Uh, they were done by our student. And uh, when I was preparing this talk, I said, well, but this is super regular. These curves have derivatives, nice derivatives. So maybe, uh, ah, not only nice derivatives, but also, nice pointwise correlations between the fat and the absorbance. And the correlations are really very different. And people roughly like, like this. So maybe using a semi-metric that takes this into account, it would work better. But I don't know. I have the feeling that they would work better. So maybe choosing a semi-metric that takes this kind of stuff into account would really make a difference. But uh, of course, I cannot tell. Because I would have said that uh, here, L2 would work remarkably better and doesn't. The error of L2 is slightly bigger than the other ones, but it's bigger. So uh, I don't know what to think. Uh, so uh, I got quite disappointed with uh, this stuff. So, uh, well, little, little comments, a failure of a, of a, of a project. And of course, performance varies broadly. You've seen different semi-metrics. Of course, computational burden is uh, much faster when we use L2 norms than when we use Wasserstein or Hausdorff metric. Hausdorff is terrible. It's the slowest, even slower than Wasserstein's distance. 
so I thought, uh, I, I think that it, the use of other semi-metrics, that the ones that include derivatives, could do better, but I'm not really sure. And uh, another thing could be, okay, what about uh, smoothing before? Maybe if we smooth, uh, just taking splines or uh, principal components or whatever, uh, and then try to use uh, uh, L2, that could work at least faster, but I am not really sure whether it would work better, but at least could be faster. But uh, as I said, when I began, I don't think that uh, functional statistics <coughs> has room for improvement on it's it's a nice mathematical model because in the end it goes to functional analysis, Kahuna and Loeb expansions and, and beautiful stuff. But apart from being having a nice theory behind that it doesn't come from statistics, it comes from functional analysis. I don't see there's future in this line of research. And I promised I would be brief and yes, uh, I think that's it. So huh? Very nice to hear you so enthusiastic. <laughs> it's not enthusiastic, it's enthusiastic against something. So uh, we could have something, someone enthusiastic with the functional statistics to prove me wrong. There are many people. Philippe Vieux. Uh, Philippe Vieux. Some, some years ago, he told me if you are not with functional statistics, that means that you are against. So are you with? Mm. Uh, not against, but... Uh, in between. No, I just won't go further. Myself. I mean, I'm not against other people doing what they want to do with their lives. That's their business, but I, I'm not really sure. I mean, the model is nice, but in the end, it's uh, okay. it's multivariate statistics. Yeah, for sure. I, I it's, uh, it, there's nothing new in, in, in the... Okay, uh, maybe I don't record that. Maybe. <laughs> I, I should stop. I stop recording. I should have.